when he said there was no history of terrorist attacks in Russia, his statements about um, the church, his mission about Ukraine, I think will point to, should we say, somebody becoming convinced of his own PR. And I think we should be factoring that in uh, as he enters his current term. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And this time we're catching up with the former UK defence attaché to Moscow and Kiev, John Foreman, CBE. A Royal Navy veteran, he's had military diplomatic appointments in the US with NATO and the EU and served on global maritime operations. He's now an independent consultant specialising in Russia, Ukraine and international security and a mentor to future defence leaders. Uh, John Foreman, welcome back. It's good to see you. Uh, John, as Ukraine desperately awaits the US $61 billion aid package, the UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron has this week made his second visit to the US to try and convince Republicans it's in America's national interest for Putin's forces not to make any more advances in Ukraine. Um, How urgent is it for more bold, unified leadership from the West? And how might that look? Well, it's good... uh... Good afternoon, Kate. Good to be back. And I think um, you, you focus on leadership. I think the problem has been, as I think we spoke about seven months ago, about the lack of leadership in Washington, uh, especially as we saw that the Ukraine offensive last year was going to fail. The, the question then was, what next? And here we are seven months later. It strikes me that the problems of both leadership are by the administration and also political infighting within Congress. But at the same time, I think on in Europe, there has been a realization over the last seven months, eight months, that Ukraine really matters and that Ukraine could lose. And you saw increasingly, I think, st- sterner language coming out of France, the UK, and Mr. Cameron in particular, trying to make the case why Ukraine matters and why Ukraine needs weapons. I mean, I think the question is not just leadership, of course, it comes down to weapons. I and mean, as we're seeing in Ukraine at the moment, Without weapons, Ukraine will lose. Uh, that's what the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe said yesterday. He, the side that can't shoot back loses. That's the that's the rule of war. And I think uh, we've seen problems with Ukrainian air defences, uh, in particular, which is allowing Russia to pick off the Ukrainian energy infrastructure. So I think that hopefully that message, which Mr. Cameron took quite to Mr. Trump and into into Washington, is getting through. But I I worry that. Ukraine's fate is all being wrapped up in political games ahead of the elections. Because you, you last time also, you've described President Biden as being asleep at the wheel over Ukraine. Well, I think I said that to, to another podcaster. I think the risk is the accusation he could be perceived as asleep at the wheel. Um, it's very handy for people to blame the Republicans and the far right of the Republican Party, particularly the House of Representatives. But actually, some of this drift and dithering precedes the time when Biden had the presidency, the Senate and the House of Representatives before the midterm elections. And I think you're seeing consequences of some of the early decisions taken in 2022 after the invasion to try and manage escalation with Russia. So there's been a constant delay in giving the weapons Ukraine's needs. Ukraine asked for fixed wing fighters in 2022. They still haven't got them in 2024. They asked for artillery. Some nations gave it. It took a long time to get the artillery pieces to Ukraine. They've asked for air defences. They've asked for tanks. And each time there's been a big discussion and it's added delay and allowed Russia to rebuild itself after the initial failure of their invasion. On the other side of the world, while um, this foreign secretary has been in the US, the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has met Xi Jinping in Beijing, where they discussed bolstering alliances on security in the Asia Pacific. And there will be a visit, we understand, by President Putin. Um, China does seem to be increasingly supporting Russia's war efforts, helping build artillery, shells, rockets, etc. Is this alliance genuinely strengthening, do you think? Yes, I think it is. I mean, I think it was described previously as a, an alliance without limits, a partnership without limits. And I think it's always been a misbalanced alliance. Russia is desperate for allies, having estranged itself from the civilised world. And it's obviously thrown itself at the mercies of China for support for its invasion, its economy. China is propping up the Russian war machine. It's providing oil which trade tools and also components, which you might say dual-use components for its war machine, but without ever really stepping into direct military support. 
but I think it is a substantial relationship. It's misbalanced. Uh, Russia fears its decline. Um, but I don't think it's as strong as it's portrayed. I think for China, it's very much a marriage of convenience. You saw the US Secretary for the Treasury, um, Ms. Yellen, in Beijing, obviously sending messages to China not to support uh, Russia directly for military action. Otherwise, they could feel the force of US sanctions on the Chinese banks. So I think Mr. Xi is balancing wider Chinese national interests with some support of Russia. I mean, they are aligned in quite a lot of ways. They're both anti-American. They're both quite autocratic. They're both cynical realists. But I don't think it's the sort of true meaty of minds that Russia likes to portray. And if we turn to the situation on the ground in Ukraine, you believe that Russia's focus has been on absorbing territory it's taken into Russia proper and taking over the Donbass. How does this fit into the overall strategy, do you think? Yeah, I, mean, I think Mr. Putin's overall strategy remains the same as it was two years ago. He wants to subjugate Ukraine. He wants to destroy Ukraine's statehood. He wants to install a puppet government in Kiev. That's quite clear. Now, whether he can achieve that in one go, I don't know. Probably not, given the sort of strength of the Ukrainian resistance and the support to date. But I think that's his overall goal. So I think his immediate priorities are more focused in the Donbass. He made quite a big message of that during his re-election, quote-unquote, campaign uh, earlier this year to say that um, the Donbass protection of quote of people in Donbass and the Donetsk was a priority. And I think you're seeing that play out through the ground, on the ground. So, for example, uh, I think his, after the successes in Avdivka, we saw in February, Russian forces have continued to grind westwards, both in Avdivka and a bit further north towards Slavyansk. I think that's his main effort. I think that's what the army is focusing on. But I think it doesn't preclude, do I say, diversion or other probing attacks elsewhere on the front, which Russia now has the men and material to attack in multiple places at once. But I think the main efforts in Donbass. I think, secondly, I think part of that campaign of bringing, quote, Ukraine to heel, unquote, you know, we're seeing that destruction of the Ukrainian energy infrastructure. I mean, I've been to the place which was bombed last night, it's just south of Kiev, huge plant. That provides bulk electricity to Kiev, the city capital region, and, and around it. Without that, uh, and then uh, the other plants which have been destroyed by Russia things are going to become increasingly difficult. And we're only six months away from the next winter. You know, winter comes early in Ukraine. Ukraine has six months to try and sort that problem out. Otherwise, people are going to freeze next year. And I think that builds into that whole difficulties of the battlefield, difficulties in the infrastructure, difficulties about morale. I mean, I spoke to people this week who are working in Kiev, and the overall message was one of gloom. You spoke last time about uh, Putin's obsession with Ukraine and his desire to dismember it, reclaim it as Russia. Um, but you are clear in your mind that anyone who says NATO is next is wrong. Given NATO's extensive nuclear and conventional capabilities, these economic, technological and demographic advantages, how much of this is about touting a narrative to scare the West into avoiding escalation when, when people go around saying NATO is next. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a very good way of persuading people not to escalate and to, to, to come back from, the, from supplying Ukraine what it's asking for. Yeah, I think it's right. I mean, as you know, I wrote an article on this for The Spectator a couple of weeks back. And it was prompted by a lecture given by the Chief of Defence Staff, Admiral Radikin, who said, Russia would not attack us because Russia will lose and NATO will win. But I took it even further back and I said I didn't think that Russia had the intent or the capability to attack NATO in the first place. In fact, Putin said so twice in the last couple of months. Anybody who thinks we're going to attack NATO is 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 mad, deluded. We're not going to do it. So I think he's he's always said going back years that NATO is not a target. Much of the sort of NATO is next narrative is coming out of people in the West themselves. You know, you've got ex defense and security officials, ex diplomats, you've got people lobbying for greater defense spending, you've got people who want greater defense investment on the eastern flank of NATO. I think there's also that sort of tendency to believe the Russian threat is, is all encompassing and everywhere. So I think they have to be a bit more focused. I saw the president of Sweden, of Finland, sorry, President of Finland just said. It's highly unlikely that Russia was going to attack 
NATO, the head of the US intelligence organization, the director of national intelligence, she said it was almost certain, quote unquote, that Russia didn't have the intent to attack NATO. That doesn't mean we should be sitting our laurels. There is a discussion to be had about how much we spend on defense, how much we spend on resilience, making our infrastructure more resilient to the sort of attacks we're seeing you know, in Ukraine, and how much we invest in credible deterrence, both nuclear and conventional attack, to defend ourselves and to punish any attack uh, on NATO. But at the moment, I don't see it. I don't think Russia has the intent or capability to go down that path. I think Putin, if he wins in Ukraine, will be wholly absorbed, wholly focused on absorbing Ukraine into Russia proper. That's going to be a massive, massive task. So what kind of threat does Russia pose to the UK and other allies domestically in a way which is below the threshold of war? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think if you you have nuclear, which I think will take slightly differently, conventional and unconventional threats, I think the threat against Europe and the UK in particular is from the unconventional area. So the propaganda, the relentless propaganda, influence peddling, peddling, use of social media, fake news, the info operations such as you know hacking, uh, cyber crime, trying to, uh, to try and degrade um, our you know, key critical national infrastructure. I think there's also building uh, alternative access as a foreign policy, so you know, global south, Africa, and Asia and elsewhere. Uh, but I think a lot of it is corruption, good old corruption, corrupting public officials to take decisions which are not necessarily in, in the UK national interest. So I think if the threat is unconventional, it's been termed 75 years ago as political warfare. I think political warfare is the greater threat, not a conventional nuclear attack on NATO. And what, what does President Putin stand to gain from that kind of influence? Well, I think you know, if we go back to Putin's goals before uh, the invasion of Ukraine, he stated that obviously Ukraine was number one. He wanted to reabsorb Ukraine into his sphere of influence. He wants to divide and rule within Europe. He wants to reassert Russia back into uh, a serious security actor in Europe at the expense of NATO. So he wants to divide NATO. He wants to reduce our confidence. He wants to divide Europe from the US in particular. Uh, not just the removal of US nuclear weapons from Europe, but also to encourage the drift of, towards isolationism uh, in America, which we're seeing. So I think more glo- and globally, he wants to you know, reassert his great power status uh, in the world as an anti-Western pole of opposition to what he sees as Western hegemony. So he can achieve those things without going to war. He can achieve those, as you said, below the threshold of war. To be honest, he's been doing it for 20 years, poisoning, assassinations, corrupting. Uh, and I think that's likely to continue. On that note, um, you have written another article, which is due out in The Spectator, called, it's about so-called Havana Syndrome. It's yeah. described as a zombie idea. Can you explain this idea? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean obviously, I was tracking Havana Syndrome before I went to Moscow. I mean, out of naked self-interest. This is the accusation that uh, foreign actors have been using radio wep- weapons against the heads of US diplomats and making them ill. And it started in Cuba in 2016, and there's been various reports of attacks, and up to a thousand US diplomats had reported similar sorts of symptoms. Now, what, what prompted me to write the article was a recent piece in The Insider which is an investigative magazine looking at Russia, accusing Russia directly of the involvement in these Havana syndrome type attacks. And the problem you have with that report, of course, is on the other side, the US have spent years and years and years investigating these alleged attacks, and they haven't found any evidence, both medical or physical, or indeed in their sort of intelligence. So you have these sort of two sides. And my idea, my point was, Zombie ideas such as Havana syndrome are used by various people for other interests. So you have the victims themselves who have suffered symptoms. They need proper investigation. My heart's with them. Whether it's, as the Americans said, it's to do with stress or whether it's to do with underlying conditions or so environmental factors, 
the vast majority. But these things are used to bash the administration or to, as part of the sort of general sense that the Reds are under the bed, that Russia is everywhere where they're not. It distracts us from where Russia actually is operating below the threshold, using the tools we've spoke about to try and destabilise and divide us. So that's my point. Um, I wasn't convinced by the argument in the Insider magazine. I wasn't convinced that there was enough evidence to stack up this very large accusation that the hand of Russia is behind these attacks. And the question I asked myself, of course, is why wasn't I targeted and why my colleagues weren't targeted in Russia? Why go to the difficulty of going to rural Florida to attack an FBI agent when there's a whole set of tethered goats or guinea pigs ready to be attacked in Moscow, especially in the lead up to and following the war when the relations have gone particularly south and actually a lot of the attacks have stopped. So I think my other point was a lot of think I think you know stress of diplomats may have played a part in some or maybe many of the reported attacks. And as I say in the article, you know, I experienced the symptoms associated with the Hannah syndrome myself. I never attributed it to the hand of the Russians. I thought I was stressed, yeah. And so did my friends. And I've consulted widely with my former colleagues and serving colleagues, they all thought it was a bit ropey, to be honest, the whole accusation, the Russians have it. They think it's just, there's other explanations more credible than the GRU, military intelligence running around with a super weapon. So do you think that is the explanation then, that it is just, I mean, there is something unusual about it, even if that is the explanation? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think it's something fishy, as an American friend of mine put it, who's a serving diplomat, American diplomat. There's something up, it's fishy. But the problem is, you know, once somebody reports it somewhere, if you're told to be hyper vigilant for such an attack, I can see in the pressure cooker atmosphere where we serve and served that these things could start to get a life of their own. So, yes, I think America, the Americans have said they've investigated it for five years. They've left the door open for further investigations, especially if a weapon can be shown or indeed there's a medical, um, clear medical uh, evidence link to the syndrome. But at the moment, I'm pretty agnostic, of course, even if you know, I'm sceptical about the whole thing. So when you were serving in Moscow then, uh, presumably from what you say, this is not something that people warned you about, said you had to watch out for, but there would have been other security considerations you had to take. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Havana... Beijing, Tehran, Moscow are extremely high threat environments. You know, we're warned about that beforehand. You live in this pressure cooker sort of um, envi- environment with your colleagues. Um, the Russians make our, well, in my case, the Russians make our lives very difficult on a daily basis with you know, incessant surveillance. And they do that to put more pressure on us, to cloud our judgment and to make us less, less effective. And then, of course, you've got the other factors of after sanctions, you can't get home easily, you know, can't travel, or they put travel restrictions on, they follow you around, they want to try and build that sense of isolation and, you know, and difficulty. Um, but I thought, sometimes, sorry, that surveillance ticks over into harassment, direct harassment by the Russians against us. Um, I think it's just part of the path of the course. I, mean, I think most people who go into these posts have a you know, open eye. They go in open eye. They don't go in expecting it all to be like Paris and suddenly you find it's not like Paris. It's it's a very different world. And you know, I, I think some support um of each other, family support, give some time off. It's maintaining a sense of perspective is important. But again, the Russians have always been hostile to us. It's always been a difficult post going back 100, over 100 years. So it's not a surprise that diplomats continue to report interference and, and harassment and surveillance today. So regardless of, of what you think of this article uh, on Havana Syndrome, what it did do was it sort of pointed the finger at the Russian military intelligence unit at 29155. Um, whatever the truth... Um, can you tell me a bit about the unit and how aware you were of their activities when you were in Moscow? Well, obviously, I arrived in Moscow in 2019, and 
the um, that unit had been fingered for the poor poisons at Salisbury in 2018, which had caused this massive rupture in our diplomatic relations. And then there was reports of this unit perhaps offering bounties in Afghanistan when Allied troops were still serving in Afghanistan and subsequently involved in sabotage and uh, other you know, nefarious activities in Europe, especially in Bulgaria, and perhaps in some poisonous assassination. So this, this unit, as I understand it, was seen as you know, Putin's you know, high risk, high reward, with high, highly trained set of assassins going off to do Putin's bidding to achieve political goals. Now, I think the, the motives of that unit tend to be fairly prosaic. They tend to be poisoning, shootings, bombs. They don't tend to be super cyber weapons. But I think they are. Um, I think they would regard themselves at the tip of the spear. And I think Putin, over the last few years, has lost patience with some parts of his security services. And that space, the GRU has stepped up and said, yes, we can do these things. I mean, having said that, they weren't particularly effective in the run-up to the war in Ukraine. I expected much more sort of Unit 29155 type activities in Ukraine before the invasion. And that didn't happen. Now, why was that? Is that because they couldn't operate there? Because the Ukrainians were better or they weren't quite as good as they are dressed up to be? But again, I think it feels it's nice to have a unit with a number which we can relate to all these sort of nefarious consequences, shall we say, and say it's always them, it's always pointing the finger. I don't think they're as good as they make themselves out to be. That's good to know. Um, you were right to wonder last time how long the imprisoned opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, would survive. And it's now the second anniversary of the imprisonment of his friend, uh, fellow Kremlin critic Vladimir Karamuza. Can the obliteration of dissent continue to be effective in keeping Putin in power? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember exactly what I said last time, but I thought, you know, Putin banged up Navalny in some hideous Siberian prison, and his, his longevity wasn't um, you know, guaranteed because whether he was going to kill him or whether he was going to let him drop to death, um, his, his prospects weren't great. I think the same is for, unfortunately, for Mr. Kurumazar and Ilya Yashin and um, Oleg Orlov and other political prisoners who are you know, imprisoned at the, at the moment, whose numbers are the greatest they've been for a couple of generations. I think um, the stamping down of internal dissent has been pretty effective, actually, in the last you know, two years since the invasion. Putin had to turn inwards against the enemy within as much as he had to turn outwards towards his perceived enemy, enemy in, in Ukraine. Um, I think, and others have noticed it, but one of the political prisoners said that Russia's descended to full tyranny, dictatorship in the last two years. It's even got worse since you and I last spoke last summer. So I think he can continue to keep a suppression on that. We saw the elections were rigged. We saw the numbers of votes were ludicrously high, whatever it was, 80. 84, 85%. He has a very large security machine which continued to stamp down. The um, opposition has been effectively, um, I don't want to use that word, uh, decapitated. Uh, the opposition has been completely demoralized and divided and sent into exile and imprisoned. There is no opposition. There are, is, there are no alternative sources of information inside Russia. Russia is doing more and more in the Kremlin to clamp down on the internet and distribution ideas. There's purgings going on. Um, they're going after the LGBT, any other minorities, including religious minorities, to prop up the regime. So unfortunately, I think the trajectory is still further downwards. And on, to complement that, there's an extraordinary piece of news in the Times this week. The President Putin is now portraying himself a bit like Jesus Christ. He's explaining his divine mission, schooling Russia's youth in traditional values against the satanic West. Mm -hmm. This was as he, um, he celebrated the opening of, of new youth centres across the country. Um, how is he using religion to prop up his regime and mould the future generations? Well, I think, firstly, I don't think Mr. Putin is particularly religious. I mean, he never had a great history of of the religious belief, but it's been used as a sort of tactic to, and cynical tactic to buy support from 
the population, 70% of whom say they are Russian Orthodox. Uh, so he pronounces himself, he portrays and sees as, he's portrayed more in church, you know, as, as a man of piety. He lights candles. Um, he makes statements like, you know, crazy religious statements, as you mentioned. But I don't think he's living a particularly Christian life in either his behaviour or in his heart. If you, you know, I read the thing the Archbishop of Canterbury wrote about after visiting Ukraine about Christian values of love and mercy and grace, the care for suffering, the care for little children, and and the wish for peace. None of which Putin's observing. But I think he's using religion as another weapon to bind the population to him. Two years, um, three years ago, they published the national security strategy, and in there was lots of talk about traditional values, including orthodoxy. And he uses the Russian Orthodox Church as his agent to spread the message of Holy Russia, Russia under attack, in return for their support. So, orthodoxy is part of his messianic mission to make make Russia great again through sort of muscular Christianity, portraying Russia and himself as good and portraying ourselves as evil. And you saw that that statement the Russian Orthodox Church adopted. In that light then, do you see this as, as a cynical propaganda manoeuvre manoeuvre by the Russian president rather than a sign that he's becoming delusional? Well, I mean, we always have this great discussion about what, you know, how, how rational Mr Putin is. I mean, he has been making some pretty strange statements since his re-election, both on election night when his face looked, I would thought, a bit peculiar. He's obviously become a bit convinced of his own, um, his, his own, um, he's, become a, he's become convinced, sorry, of his own um, mission, his own destiny, that he's a man of destiny, that he's Vladimir the Great. And so I think that statement, statements about after the wake of the terrorist attacks in the Crocus, uh, Hall, when he said there was no history of terrorist attacks in Russia, his statements about um, the church, you know, his mission about Ukraine, I think will point to, should we say, somebody becoming convinced of his own PR. And I think we should be factoring that in uh, as he enters his current term. Just to, to talk briefly about um, the way Ukraine is fighting the war right now, and it is increasingly taking the war to Russia with its long-range attacks on oil refineries and military facilities supporting Russia's air campaign. The attacks on oil refining, refineries causing a fuel crisis, while ammunition and artillery shortages hamper Ukraine's ability to go on the offensive along the front lines. How effective is this? Yes, well, I think obviously both Russia and Ukraine have been attacking attacking so-called strategic targets. So as you said, Russia's been attacking military industrial complex, command and control, air defense, uh, energy sites. And Ukraine has been trying to strike targets behind the front line to gain advantage. Now, it lacks the tools to do that because of the paucity of weapons and the unwillingness of Germany to provide similar weapons to Ukraine and its problem with the Americans. So it's using its drones against these refineries. I think, personally, I think it's a very clever strategy. Um, targets key vulnerability in the Russian system that Russia produces a huge amount of crude oil, exports a lot for to other countries, including China, and it keeps some back to refine for products from like unleaded and diesel and lubricants and aviation fuel, and all the things we use oil for. And those refineries have a single point of failure, which is the refining tower. So Ukrainian strikes have both increased the prices and reduced the supply of those products over the last couple of weeks. And I think they're a legitimate military target. Those products support directly Putin's war machine. The UK and the US have targeted those similar facilities in the Second World War and the First Gulf War during the Kosovo campaign and the Second Gulf War. These are known contributors, these facilities, contributors to mobility and sustainment on the battlefield. The problem that I, I worry about is that Ukraine doesn't have the capability to repeatedly hit them. So we, we, normally in an air campaign, it's not just one hit, it's the second, third, fourth to make sure these things are knocked out and to stop the Russians from rebuilding them. So I think the Russians have got problems rebuilding them anyway because lack of access to technology due to sanctions. But 
we'll have to see how it plays through on the battlefield. Russia's got alternative supplies from Belarus and can import products from members of its axis. And um, as Ukraine um, constantly tries to find new ways uh, to uh, keep the pressure up on Russia as it waits for those vital supplies of artillery and ammunition. Um, the UK has just signed this framework agreement to cooperate in the Defence and Arms Production Centre to help inside Ukraine itself. BAE Systems would, for instance, conduct maintenance, uh, repair and overall light guns on the ground in Ukraine. And there have been many drone uh, producers present at this conference. Time, though, is of the f- essence. Um, in spite of this uh, partnership, can, can it make a difference or is this for longer term? I think it's for longer term. I, mean, I read the speech of General Kavali, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, yesterday. He said, at, at present, Ukraine cannot produce the weapons it needs to defend itself. It has to rely on foreign supply. Now, Germany, UK, France, America, and, and private business themselves have put in arrangements to do more of the production and maintenance and support inside Ukraine itself. But that's going to take a number of years to play through so there's a gap between now where ukraine's on the back foot being bombed heavily and being ground back on the donbass and the supply coming on and i think that's where the u.s support 61 billion is absolutely critical without those weapons i think ukraine's chances of victory are zero and i think uh, the chance that Putin will, can smell victory given those delays and dithering in Congress. Now, 2024 is a critical year for all in this war. If we don't support Ukraine this year, Ukraine may not be surviving until 2025. You mentioned um, in an interview elsewhere that the kind of appeasement of Putin we've seen by the West would not have happened under Reagan or Kennedy, certainly not under Churchill, I'm sure. But what when you look at the desperate situation today that Ukraine finds itself in militarism, it's often getting it too late, uh, it's, but it's hanging on. And, and there are rumours of trying to push Ukraine into a negotiated peace settlement. Where and what gives you the most optimism at the moment? There's a lot of gloom about it. I think the optimism I would take is you know, the spirit and will of the Ukrainian people to defend themselves, defend their, their own values, their democracy, their country. As we've seen, um, notwithstanding the difficulty on, in the battlefield, Ukrainian troops are providing you know, stirring defences. Um, and I think the public and the Ukrainian people are behind them. So I'm optimistic about that. I'm not optimistic about <laughs> the, the position of the US, but things could change. I mean, I think war is a sort of series of ebbs and flows. We've had some pretty grim times in the past in our own wars, which... Uh, turned out for the better in the long, longer term. But I think 2024 being so important um, in the summer, if the Russians, if the Ukrainians have stopped the Russians from advancing, if some of these weapons come on line, either from America or from elsewhere, if Putin's forces themselves suffer continued attrition, both from mega material and grind to a halt, then I could be able to claim some degree of optimism. But I think at the moment I'm more in the half empty glass of glass of water on now for unfortunately you left moscow seven months after russia launched its full-scale invasion can you just tell me a bit about what it was like living in moscow at that time and then also what it was what you said when you handed over to your replacement yeah, sure. i mean obviously i think last time we spoke about the run-up to to the war and the misery of ben wallace and just just the incredible pressure we were under and then you know it changed from before the so what's going to happen, John? When's it going to happen to? Why is it happening? What's happened next? Um, and certainly I felt myself in that sort of February, March, April time, just, you know, unbelievable levels of personal pressure. I've seen my friends in Ukraine being bombed, you know, millions of people evacuated. The thought that Russia might commit hideous war crimes in Ukraine, then the evidence coming through a place like Butcher, where we could see what the, what the Russians have been up to. And then there's some more, you know, I spent probably the next few months reporting and trying to give balance and objective input into uh, Whitehall, both on terms of you know, what's going on and also on terms of policy for the future. But so I handed over after almost three years and 
I think I said to him in our brief handover, that's I say to most attaches, is you're not there to go become a supporter for your nation. You need to say objective and strategic. That's what people read. If you want ministers to read your reporting, you've got to stay at the ministerial level and know your audience back in London. There's no point in sort of finding stuff which gets lost. So that's one is you know, know who you're talking to or what they want to know. I think secondly, you're the only person on the ground from the Ministry of Defence. Now, people read an awful lot of stuff online. I get confronted with it. It's sent to me and say, John, what do you think about this? And I have to dampen down expectations. You're the only one who knows what people look like, what they will talk to you about, what they smell like, you know, what it feels like on the metro and the bus. What's the mood? And I think that's where you provide value above perhaps reading your things online or on Twitter. Um, I said to him to stay close to our FCO colleagues. There's no time for this sort of traditional FCO, MOD, headbanging. You leave all that to London. You know, we're a very small team. So no staying, department rivalry. Yeah, so I didn't want any of that to play through. And so obviously staying close to the ambassador. And I also said, you know, to travel if you could to get out of Moscow, because Moscow is not Russia. People will talk to you if you get outside and actually find out their mood and what they think about the situation. And then you can put, build that into your reporting. And ultimately, don't let the blighters grind you down, because as we said, that's what they want you to do. Um, but as I said before, you know, I read a memoir of an attache in Russia before the First World War, and they had exactly the same problems that I experienced. So it's never been a particularly easy posting. And it never will be. John Foreman, it's been great talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Jerbo. If you'd like to support us, you can subscribe now or listen to Times Radio or go to thetimes.co.uk. My thanks to our producer today, Morgan Burdick, and to you for watching. Bye for now.